funny. Um, for those who are just joining, I see more attendees coming on on Facebook and in this room and on our socio app. We are here with the wonderful Levi McDougall, who is a comedian and writer, actor, and currently a writer performer for Conan. Um, and he's joining us from sunny Los Angeles for a Q&A. I think we're going to dive into it and begin. I'm Jessica Fox. I'm the Screen and Broadcast Sector Specialist for Expo North. We have a Q&A button. It is a Q&A. We do have a Q&A button on the bottom of the screen. I'm going to be selfish and I'm going to be asking the questions to start with, but we will have time at the end for folks who want to ask questions. This is our last event of Expo North for the day, so we have saved the best for last. Levi, welcome. So if this, if this crashes and burns, I've ruined the whole festival. <laughs> or it just shows the caliber of the festival if I just said we say the best for last. <laughs> so now you you have to be great. <laughs> no pressure. Um, Leva, it's such a joy to see you again and have you here. Um, can we start a little bit with who, just who you are and what you do? Sure. Um, so Leva, I'm Dougal. I'm um, probably in my early 40s, I would guess, <laughs> at this point. Uh, I started doing... Um, I always I wanted to do stand up from a pretty young age from finding comedy albums and then just really? couldn't get, yeah probably from maybe twelve or thirteen oh. and uh, at that time you could rent a lot of comedy specials talk shows were still kind of the main thing but okay. into the eighties shows like Evening at the Improv there was then that huge influx so it was a good time to get interesting because that that was kind of the stand up comedy boom yeah 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 um, but I could never get up the nerve to do it. Um, even getting into like my later teens where it would have been possible for me to get into a club. So there's a big improv theater in Calgary, Alberta, where I grew up in, in Western Canada, okay. uh, called Loose Smith's Theater, that I tend to meet a lot of uh, foreigners know about it because they, they do international summer schools and then people that go there will come and teach. Keith Johnstone did it, who like Bob Odenkirk is a big fan of. And so there's American kind of people who are aware of it. But Growing up, it just happened to be the improv theater in my city. It was only later that I found out it was great. And wow. a great setup where if you volunteered for like two hours a month, you would get unlimited free classes, which Gosh. is crazy, especially in LA where every kind of famous improv thing here is so expensive and they have tiers of, you know, $300 oh, totally. for level it one. But for, it is expensive. It's, it's such a thing. And uh, I, I get, but in, in Calgary, it's kind of nice too, because you're removed both in Canada, we don't have obviously the showbiz industry of, of the US, but then Calgary's not a hub. So in a good way, no one's doing it for that reason. Whereas in LA, you'll still get people that are, you know, an actor who's doing stand up, even though they don't really have an interest, but they're like, my agent said this might, you know, get me out there more. Yeah. So um, I started doing improv there. And then in my early 20s, moved to Toronto to do a, at the time there was a one year post-grad comedy writing and performance program at Humber oh, wow. College, which still does a, uh, I think now a two year um, comedy program. And they were great. And it was a good way to both get into Toronto with a bit of a structure for a year to, and I moved with three other friends from Lou Smith's mm -hmm. who went in. Um, and most of us are still doing comedy now, but so I did stand up for a while. I was in Toronto for 10 years. So I got into stand up there. Mm -hmm. Well, then I'm going to pause. I'm going to pause you yeah. Like, yeah. I, before we get into your Toronto years. I want to rewind back to little Levi. And you said something that I think is pretty extraordinary. You said that you wanted to be a stand up by the like since you were little, even like 12. And you referenced that you saw you could like rent films, you saw people doing it. But what in you wanted to do that? That would be terrifying for most people. What about it looked appealing? What what connect? Why did you connect with that? You know, I think it was, uh, I always liked writing. So I was pretty okay. good at writing and I liked words. So I was a big reader when I was a kid. And I liked um, like Shel Silverstein and things that were a little more stylistic. And I think when I saw that in stand up, so I remember th there was a series of concerts called Comic Relief that mm -hmm. they taped for, I think it was a homeless, um, a benefit for homelessness and awareness. And it was Robin Williams, Whoopi Goldberg, Billy Crystal that posted. Okay. And then they had all these stand-ups. So that was the first time I saw Stephen Wright, who probably had the biggest oh. impact on me, but like a very writerly, one-liner, you know, clever, very low-key kind of comic. And I think when I saw that, I'd already liked stand-up. Like I think I, An Evening at the Met, which was an old Robin mm -hmm. Williams concert, um, was kind of one of the big ones that 
I had all these tapes from the Columbia House and Tape and we could get like 12 tapes for a penny and then and then you're going to be in debt for the rest of your life because they ruined your credit rating and you're a kid. You <laughs> for. But I just, I got all their comedy albums. So I, I liked it. I liked the world of it. And it was intriguing to me. And I think probably as a kid, the simplicity of it makes sense. Because like if you're watching a TV show, I wouldn't be like, how do you even do that? But when it's someone on a stage talking, you're like, well, I know how to talk. And yeah. I can't do that. But, but so I think seeing Stephen Wright, I think the first thought was probably like, oh, you're allowed to do it like that? Oh, well then that works for my brain. Yeah. And, um, and then later, like Mitch Hedberg and kind of more absurdist, sillier, it tends to be kind of non-topical comics, probably too, because I got into it so young, I wasn't getting political references. And like Lenny Bruce was someone that I remember kept try I kept trying to get into because I really loved his storytelling and on his albums, he yeah. just had like a story about visiting a small town that I could get into, but there was so much, you know, political yeah. so sanity and stuff. I just didn't have the context for it. But, Did you um, have a lot of support? So was this a secret that you carried with you that like you wanted to do this or were you quite, did you wear it on your sleeve? Was it part of your identity and were people supporting? No, I, um, I probably would have talked to a couple of friends about it and like, my, my mom would have known I was okay. into it. And she's, she's very much of the mind of kind of, do what you love probably so I, I never had to deal with that well it's not a viable yeah. career yeah, 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 yeah. and I, I think too just growing up my stepdad had a patch where he was kind of in and out of work very early on I said like oh nothing's for sure no for job sure. career really? seems stable so why not try the one you love yeah um that makes and sense and then yeah and then and then I think once I I knew that I at least kind of liked the idea of doing comedy those are the friends I found in high school, like mm -hmm. people I could banter with and, uh, and in part-time jobs, I would, you know, you kind of find the, not even necessarily the clever people, but the playful people who like to play with ideas and, yeah. and, and aren't too precious about stuff. So it's a big deal too. When you find, you surround yourself with people with the same passions. So you start doing that improv, those improv classes, and then you move to Toronto and you find more of your, your people, my guess is. So tell, tell me about yeah. that in Toronto. Yeah. And I think with that, you're always, the, as the years go on, and even still, your your focus is narrowing a little bit, just as far as what you want to try at, at any given yeah. time. Yeah. When I went to um, Toronto, I would have first been doing some stand-up shows, and I was a huge Kids in the Hall fan growing up, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, diehard Kids in the Hall fan, and where it was, like, a polarizing thing, when I was in junior high, that's when Kids in the Hall came out, and people at least the people I knew you were like kids in the hall person or a Saturday Night Live person <laughs> so I've had to deprogram myself and like I had this thing against SNL which had no logic <laughs> but it was just because as a kid and probably there was also an element of like not only did I think kids in the hall was better and I think would have liked it no matter where it was from but that it was Canadian yeah. and we just don't have even now there's the there's not a lot of hit shows or you know yeah. Canadian content out there and um and so being in Toronto is where I started doing sketch. So I had a sketch group called The Distractions. And we started doing a monthly show at the Rivoli, actually, in downtown Toronto, where the Kids in the Hall started. Yeah. It's a great venue. It's still there. And, um, and so off of that, my sketch group got a pilot for the Comedy Network. So oh. we got a, a half-hour pilot with, uh, you know, a blend of, like, pre-taped and then live, live yeah, sketch. Yeah, yeah. And then... Um, kind of around that time I was starting to do more TV work with my stand-up because so I had one there's a like a contest called the Tim Sims for up-and-coming comics okay. that I I won early on and now I should know this 2001 uh no later I'll figure it out but um <laughs> a part of the prize the contest itself was televised and then part of the prize for the winner was an appearance on uh open mic with Mike Bullard which was the only late night show in Canada and Canada still doesn't have we we don't have a late night show now so oh, there's not a showcase on tv for stand-ups that's something they've always kind of struggled with building a star system and yeah and it was frustrating being so close to the U.S. as a Canadian because the Canadian industry at least then tries to model itself after the U.S. which they just can't compete with because they don't have the budget they don't have the resources yeah and then uh, but as a kid you're like yeah but look at England they're small and they they can make low budget 
super high quality comedy, do that, copy that. Don't try to do the US thing because then you just, it looks like a cheap knockoff. Yeah. Do the thing that's like a distinct, we have our own comedy, like get out there. And it's still, I still struggle with that with Canada. So hopefully, hopefully they'll see this and smarten up. Yeah. <laughs> well, immediately. I bet they're on it right now. Oh, they're quaking in their boots, all the yeah, power totally. they have. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so it was, so I was in uh, Toronto for about 10 years with that and, and did my first TV writing gigs there. Um, oh, there was a show called Pop Cultured with Elvira Kurt, which was kind of an entertainment uh, oriented version of The Daily Show in that vein. So we were doing four shows a week. That's a big a deal. Song. This was a paid proper job in comedy. Oh, it, it was huge, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, when I interviewed for it, they kind of knew a bit of my stand-up. So I got hired to be both a writer and an on-air correspondent. Um, so it was a great, and the fact that we had a small, I think under 10 writing staff for, wow. you know, four half hour shows, but we were so new. I didn't know that was oh, a small yeah. staff or that we were overwhelmed. Just like, oh, this is hard and we're staying late and it's a lot of work, but yeah. it was so fun. And it's all your friends and we're kind of trying to figure it out. And um but yeah, it was a great. Do you feel like at that point in your career, do you feel like you made it? Or did you feel like there was there something beyond that that you were really striving towards? Yeah, um, it's funny. I mean, just one element is it's awesome to get paid first yeah. off in comedy. But the other thing in Canada is, is you're not getting paid that much for TV. <laughs> like you sort of have an idea of what an American TV writer would make in the ballpark of. So in Canada, you're like, oh, yeah, this couldn't. I can't retire off, uh, <laughs> okay. and I can't buy a home off this job with this job. But as a kid, you're not thinking like that because it's just nice to get paid. But as far as knowing it was a stepping stone or, or where you wanted to go, um, it always felt like, and it's always kind of framed in Canada, at least like you leave Canada for the state. You know, you, yeah. and, and there's a reality in that. There's truth to it where you kind of, you beat on all the doors in Canada and you constantly get this sort of tone of like, well, if you're this talented, why aren't you in America? And it's oh, deflating to the point. There's a story um, which might be apocryphal where Lauren Michaels apparently pitched SNL to Canadian broadcast execs first. And they basically said that they're like, well, if it's this good, why aren't you shopping it to the U.S.? And he's like, oh, well, yeah, you're right. If this is the attitude I'm encountering, then you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, they had the cast of like, Second City SCTV talent was there, so they couldn't. It was such a golden opportunity, but it's this. I can hear, I can hear the frustration in your voice because I can hear oh. how much you know your childhood and then your young adulthood working Canada gave you, and then yet there was a ceiling. To yeah. Hit. yeah, and and I'm sure that there was some naivety in it as a kid because you don't know all the factors. But I remember you talking to me, and you're like, but you make kids in the hall. Kids in the hall was made here. Keep doing that yeah, with different yeah. people in North, but just do more and more and more and it always felt like they were starting fresh and, mm. and kind of taking the pulse of what was hot in the U.S. but because the wheels turned slower in Canada there would be this pattern you would notice just as a comedy fan where stuff would come out and you're like oh this is kind of similar to what the U.S. was doing five years ago yeah. you know or yeah. or they're overthinking simple things like so I did a an hour-long stand-up special um, I think that was in 2005. And I remember even for that in rehearsal, they're like, well, you can't have a, a stool on stage because that's like old 80s stand up and like now new stand up, no one has a stool. And I was like, <laughs> I remember I just watched like a clip that Mitch Hedberg was in. I'm like, that was shot like months ago. And no, that's not true at all. First off, why are you worrying about that? Especially with this the school. Is, yeah. <laughs> if you're focused on that, I think we might be in trouble here. Like, that's, that's not that key. Um, oh, I wonder if there is that danger of proximity and I can say this because I'm from Boston but Boston really struggled I think it now has it but struggled to find kind of the theatrical identity because all the theater got hmm. sucked in to New York and Chicago didn't have that problem but because it was like that far enough away from New York that it didn't get caught in kind of the orbit and I'm wondering if that kind of proximity kind of has to the states you just feel the gravity of it um, yeah, that's interesting because then there's definitely a comedy version of that, say even with Boston, where because they were, they got to be their own entity, there was, there's this crazy Boston scene that, you know, Stephen Wright came out of, Brian yeah. Kiley, who I worked with, is from Boston, is a great joke writer, and 
kind of great stand-up and has been around it. So you get all the stories of just that explosion of the Boston scene yeah. that can like Bob Pat Goldthwait came out of there. And yeah, they become these great incubators for talent. And then when those people go to the bigger cities like LA, New York, it feels like they came out of nowhere. So people are like, where have you been? Yeah, so yeah. They, you get a lot of people who move to New York, especially, but LA now a lot too. And then they start their stand up careers here. And oh man, I look at them like, oh, I'm so grateful I didn't do that because it's oh. the pressure so high. And and the one thing that I think you want starting out is uh, a place where it's safe to fail. And I think that's what was so great. And that's very much the philosophy of Loose Moose. So I think I was lucky to get in there, but it's just like, no, just try it. Don't be, yeah. don't be overthinking it and trying to prevent the failure before you do it. Follow your ideas Follow and only through going through it and kind of taking that leap of faith, will you start to both get a better instinct for it? And then you hone your taste and, and all that, but it only comes from taking these big swings. And mm -hmm. when you're trying to constantly and I think this will happen when people just come to LA they get in their head about oh there's going to be talent scouts in the audience and what are they looking for like what's the hot kind of sitcoms that are out there and I'm can I be that kind of comic and they're trying to kind of reverse engineer their comedy voice yeah, 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 for yeah. an industry that doesn't even know what it's doing like or what it wants totally completely totally. It's that, yeah. it's like the William Goldman thing he's like no one knows anything yeah yeah I totally. don't you and of course they'll pontificate as if they do but that's their job you can't, well that's why they get paid but it's really I, I totally a hundred percent can't do that show for you or, yeah. so Levi, you, you you were then getting paid as a writer and then what what happens so you're working long hours it's hard it's fun you may not be able to retire on it yeah the consistent thing i was always doing through it were these sketch and stand-up shows and I think I only see now in retrospect how important those were because also in light of this last pandemic year where I haven't been doing stand up, it, it was, I, I kind of had forgotten how big a part of my creative process it was. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, I think it's been hard for all comedy writers, especially someone who normally works on a show that has a live crowd, you know, so for Conan O'Brien's show, we went from you know, a packed house every day where you get a gauge and and even if something falls flat, you can play off that. There's a whole dynamic, of course, to um, they were filming in an empty theater for a year. Yeah. And and so it is a struggle and we have a great, it's the best writer's room I've ever, I've ever had. So that energy, I mean, kept us going, just having those daily meetings and people to riff off of yeah. um, as much as Zoom screws with your timing. Like we've talked about how uh, yeah, they all totally. need to go to like some sort of for, for people in the audience who might not have a sense and I don't really have a sense what is it like being part of a writer room and how does that collaboration of jokes work and sharing and things like that so the way it works on on Conan is um and this is where the zoom at least you know has a similar vibe to so we would normally get into the office around 9 nine thirty, meet in the head writer's room, which is just a large room of couches kind of around the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and so the way it works is people will send in individual pitches. So for the most part, most of the ideas start as one writer's pitch. Okay. Every now and then two writers will pitch something together. And I think that was a big thing we missed with the pandemic that I realized was such a natural thing I had done without thinking where you'll have half an idea or a little something that might be something. Yeah. And you'll wander into one of the other writers' rooms and you're like, hey, is this anything? And you'll just kind of riff on it. And either sometimes you find out it's nothing, and yeah. but it'll take it in great directions. And and the thing you want is yes, a, a safe room, basically a room where it's safe to fail. Like there's a great phrase some people will be like, okay, bad pitch, bad pitch, but this, yeah. you know. So there's no judgment of like things yeah, can yeah, fall yeah. flat. People might tease you for it, it was a really bad <laughs> idea, but. <laughs> that's fine but you kind of you're basically kind of throwing this idea in the air and you're like is this something and then people can kind of look at it from all different angles and you're like oh maybe this maybe this and then often the strange things too every now and then it'll go in a wildly different direction of like oh what if we took it over here and you're like oh yeah so sometimes you'll find yourself finishing a bit or you'll watch this great bit that just was on the show and your initials are on it often with another writer that helped you you're like yeah so funny my initials are on that given that it's so different from the idea I yeah, came that that started. but the idea you came in with is the idea that led to that idea so it's all yeah. the same thing and 
I think too, when you get a good writer's room that's there for the show, there's not a sense of like precious ownership of like, these are my ideas over here and these are your ideas over there. And some shows I think do run like that. And I think okay. that's a tone that's set from the top down. Um, and one thing, so I think with Conan, and I think him coming from a writer's background was a part of it, because uh, he was in writer's rooms at SNL and yeah. Simpson. Um, but when I, I came on the show six uh, years ago, so he'd been doing the show for 22 years. Wow. And I remember early on, I came in right before our first Comic-Con mm -hmm. week. So yeah. we started taking our show to Comic-Con in San Diego in July for these massive shows in this big, yeah. beautiful theater. Our budget was, you know, 10 times what it could normally be because you get sponsors and stuff. With the I customer. remember that because you guys, you guys got like an outfit made for Conan, didn't you? Like his own right. hero outfit. I remember that. That's right. And that was, that was my bit. And it was that you know, God, it's brilliant. I love that. Yeah. And stuff like that only came. So I was in my office going through YouTube videos of people who make superhero costumes. And there was a, a Comic-Con in like a really small, you know, maybe in Sacramento or like a little one. And someone had some YouTuber was just going around talking to people, industry people there. And um, this guy, Jose, who owns um, it's Ironhead, Ironhead Studios, mm -hmm. um, he was there. And he was very frank. It's funny now because I know him so well because we've done these bits with him. But he was just very frank about some projects he'd worked on for like big DC movies where he designed and made the superhero costumes and didn't get credited for them, which yeah. he just union roles. I was like, how did that even happen? Um, but he was, and he was fine. He was a bit of a shrug. He's like, yeah, he goes, that's obviously not why I'm in it. And it, the people in the industry know that's my work and that leads to more work and we get to create it. But he's kind of an all-in-one thing where his people are, they're the designers, they make it. They have, so, um, but just his attitude, like, oh, this is, because that's kind of for the remotes we do with Conan, you yeah. want an interesting subject matter, but the people he's interacting with, is, that's the most important thing, you know, you yeah. could have. So just that this Jose guy seemed very straightforward and it was incredible at what he does. Like, oh, let's try this. So we reached out to him to say and to pitch the idea of initially not not knowing exactly what the cost of what they do with or what their time was like maybe we could make them like a helmet like a cool like not a Thor oh, style yeah, helmet yeah, but yeah. something one element and we got talking to him and he was like uh, and he's like well we could try to just go for a whole costume um and one thing I remember him saying early which I think and it's in the the costume we have now he goes we have an extra torso from Ben Affleck's Batman oh and those are I guess like just the, all the materials and that is such a, a cost thing he's like but we already have that to work with he goes so if we can because everything that they, they use is custom and but even just the fabric all stuff he goes I think we can piece it together and then once he got into it he was just as excited as us and they oh put so much time I remember they were trying to estimate like let's say we don't know you and we had to pay for this thing and it was like over half a million dollars for like all the work they have to put into because it's all custom right and they're normally doing it for these hundred million dollar movies and they're doing it for this little comedy show um but yeah that led to so we did that one year and he debuted it um coming down from the ceiling that's in san diego you think Conan like came down this kind of cables flew in and there's smoke and the crowd is just going insane. oh my God, that's it's so cool so and then so the next year to kind of build on that, we built a superhero car. Okay. So we found this like little Volkswagen dune buggy and did uh, that with like a custom shop here and filmed it. And then our last year, we found him a nemesis. So we went back to Ironhead with Kristen Shaw, who's, you know, it's fantastic. Both stand up and improviser. She's on Bob's Burgers now and it's on oh, wow, wow, wow. And, and I had known her just a little bit through comedy stuff and she's, She's so she's also the best person to play a villain against Conan because she's so lovable. There's nothing you want more than like if the audience can end up loving his nemesis more than him and he has to work against that, like he loves that. Um, <laughs> but we brought her out on stage and it was like lightning. It was just and they had a little battle. It was so it's so silly. And when and when it's being done on a scale where as you're watching, you're like, oh, this is because I found a YouTube video of this guy. And we thought it would be fun. And that's also a testament to all the people that work on a show. So I think that kind of top-down thing where 
the writer's room is very generous. And oh, I think that just the point off of that was that Conan is very much one of those people that even with his stature of being, you know, so well regarded as a comedy writer, if you're pitching stuff with him, which we kind of would do for some comic and stuff, if you pitch a joke that beats his, it's like, there's no ego. It's like, oh, that's the better joke. Cause yeah. we're all working for the same Goal. thing. There's no sense of like, yeah, but I came up with this one and I want to win. There's no, it's like, cause everyone's been around long enough. They're like, okay, but the winning is getting the best joke on. Cause he's going to be the one saying it regardless. You know, it's, it's all making it's, the show better. How do you switch gears like that? So you're, you're working for a show, which sounds kind of almost, it's incredibly collaborative, but credit, is given where credit's due and yet you're all part of the same team. And then you hit, you also do stand up, which you're kind of on an island on your own. It's there. all me. All it, the, it's all, <laughs> well, how, me. well how, how, do you have to switch a different part of your brain? Are they actually connected in some way? I think they definitely both help each other because I think that's what I was noticing this past year and other times in my past where I haven't been doing stand up as much while I'm doing the writing. It's when I'm doing stand up all the time, my brain is just my subconscious, I'm sure, but just in the background, it's just coming up with jokes. And that's, I think that's most stand ups. And I remember Toronto just always having a notepad on me when I was the years I was doing stand up there, because when you're doing it a lot, you know that you have shows coming up. And, and I think comedy writing is the same where if you can commit to something you kind of can't get out of. So if you're stand up, book the shows before you feel ready. And you'll figure it out. And the worst case scenario is you bomb. But I think with comedy writing, obviously having a job helps because you have that hard deadline. And if you're having an off day, that doesn't matter. Come up with the best you can because we have a show. Um, but I think even between jobs, if you can find something like the monthly sketch shows we had in Toronto or even just a writing group, some sort of accountability that means something to you that you know you know you won't kind of weasel out of because which is yeah. easy to do and you're like I just need a few more weeks you know there's always going to be and that's the thing of doing you know four four shows a, a week um mm. Conan you get better and this is hard for me because I definitely have perfectionistic tendencies but you have to get to a place where stuff is good enough because okay. there's no end to tweaking a joke there's no end to tweaking a bit you can always make it a little funnier is how you feel but also the truth of it is you can also mess with it and ruin the magic in it. So you yes. kind of make peace with the deadline. You're like, this is, I think, as good as we can get it and we need it right now. Mm -hmm. And and also sometimes the urgency of that, that adds to the live energy. It's like, oh, we think this might work. We're still excited about it, but we're not totally sure. We haven't beaten it to death, so let's get out there. And that often is what sells it and makes it a great, a great bit. Uh, leave it. Okay, so I think this is a perfect time. Can we have a little show and tell? Mm. Yes. Okay. All yeah. right. Um, so these are props I grabbed. Okay, so I did a bit, and this is going to be so indicative of, it's funny to try to be like high-minded. It feels high-minded to talk about comedy. <laughs> so you do this and this and this. And then, so this, we did an ad. I did an ad when Avengers Endgame came out because it's three hours long. So we did an ad for this cross promotion they were doing with like Depends. <laughs> <laughs> so, God, that's people, so, so that people wouldn't have to leave the theater <laughs> and get through it all. That is brilliant. That's so, so good. There's um, these ones. This is from another fake commercial. I think the setup, man. I don't know. There might have been a stat about you know, like condom use going down because people were yeah. complaining that it ruined the sensation, that kind of thing. So off of that Trojan created these turtleneck condoms, <laughs> which, which you put on like a condom, but they don't have a tip on them. <laughs> so, um, so it's just- like, this You're trip. like neck warmers, you're saying, basically. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so, very valuable product. Um, but this, so this is a good indication that this is fun to tell. So okay. the thing I think I'll definitely miss the most. So right now we're wrapping up the weekly show of Conan. We have one more week oh, of yeah, four shows good. a week. Then we go into some downtime, I think for the rest of the year. Um, and the plan is to, he has a new show launching on HBO that's gonna be once a week. So it's just gonna kind of change what we do. And the nice thing about yeah. doing four shows a week is we would have regular bits that were, we call them joke buckets or like desk pieces 
that could recur and you know, and most late night talk shows. So one that we had was called Coffee Table Books that didn't sell. So it's a <laughs> huge collection of, you know, and the setup is kind of like, yeah, you know, I went down to the bookstore, they have this bin, it's all these coffee table books that didn't yeah. sell. Some of them look pretty interesting. But that, so these, and these ones, when we're like, hey guys, we need more coffee table, they were so fun to pitch on because they're just making the other writers laugh and stuff. But so this is one I did called, um, it's Dogs Who Know You're Having an Affair. <laughs> That's, I know so uh, many people in the audience right now that would absolutely want that badly. I just thought, okay, so this is another one. He's <laughs> very aware that you're having an affair. And then this guy. Oh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good look. That one doesn't look yeah. disapproving, though. No, that's he's kind like, of into it. Yeah, he's kind yeah. of into it. <laughs> yeah, he's not, not judging you. He might have his own thing going. Um, we, we did questionable cup holders. Oh my gosh, that's, that's a, <laughs> these are so good. The Bronco Rider, this, um, I think that's on the space station. I love it. Got it there. This is uh, a baby's <laughs> head. I did um, poorly placed pools. Oh, brilliant. Um, so we got um, <laughs> brilliant. Idea. these are so dumb. Like this one, I forgot. So this one I did, and you don't even know it. So we have a graphics department who's putting them together, okay. but this was. Ancient drawings and wait, is that Anderson Cooper? <laughs> Did Anderson Cooper respond to this? Because I would be chuffed, like That's really excited. I don't know if he did. If he wants a copy of this, yeah. I can get it to him. There he is on the. I old... think that one's my favorite. Is that, that the Cape of France? I love that. Okay, I'll say I have one more. I'll show you in that. So this was. I don't think I'm going to be able to get that image on my head now. Oh, good, good. That's yeah. not sweet. So this is a. Confusing alternatives to the devil and angel on your shoulder. <laughs> if you so look it up, oh. Yeah, it's the Joker and Michael <laughs> Brown, the host. This is um, me, and, and that's uh, Smokey the Bear and Danny DeVito. Ah, oh, brilliant. And then we've got uh, a Pikachu and the Pope with <laughs> one of my coworkers, Cortez. So I was in, we got to rope all our coworkers into our dumb joke when they couldn't say no. I, mean, I love those. Do you know, can we talk? I think that's also a good transition because they're perfectly tuned. So if you tweaked, I don't want to go into like analyzing it too much, like sure, Pikachu sure. and the Pope, but there's that's like a perfectly tuned joke. If you changed it a bit, it loses something. Sure. That's a really fun thing about comedy too that's hard to describe. Like when family members are like, well, how did you come up with this or how did you know this? You do just kind of do it long enough and then your taste and the taste of the show is an indicator. But there's so many bits where, like, say with Pikachu and the Pope, you couldn't really explain why that works. I know. And then there's some people who won't like it, and you can't explain why you think it's funny to them. It's like trying to, you know, get someone to like a funny movie you like that they don't like. You're like, I think it's just not your taste. Um, totally. Especially, like, also the order, like, let's say the cup holders about, like, you know, the rodeo and then the NASA and then the baby. Like, there, there's an order of them that's, like, also important, and you just, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is, I, I can't count the amount of time. So our graphics department, the great thing too is like these people are technically very good at their jobs, but then they also have to have a sense of humor on the same page, you know, because they're, they also do a lot of like CG animation for us. So the timing, they're tweaking the timing and all that. But the amount of time, say, even just with these coffee table books, where there'll be three of you having the most serious conversation <laughs> of what you're talking about, kind of the order, because you want to build so like say the dog one, you you don't want to put the winking one no. near the top because it kind of derails it. Yeah. But if you establish it, you don't want to do another judgmental dog because we've seen that you got to take it somewhere. Yeah. And there's countless versions of that where, and it's, and this is, um, so Conan obviously on the show doesn't have as much time to write. Yes. This, yeah. But his, and I remember hearing him kind of talk about this once, his skill set he's so good at editing on the fly mm. and so we'll run something through that he often hasn't seen before he probably kind of had a loose idea of the I, the general idea like our head writer will be like here's a pitch but he's never seen the script and we'll run through it and some something will just not work you know inevitably you mm. kind of got to get it on on, your, on its feet and that's why you're rehearsing but and the thing is we've been toiling over this script like he doesn't know maybe but it's version seven before he's even seen it so we think we worked out the bugs the best we can and he'll encounter something and often it's something where you're like yeah this is the best version of it but 
it's not quite hitting, but maybe it'll work. And he'll kind of hit that obstacle and be like, what if we try this? Yeah. And it's just, you're like, yes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Yeah. 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 Or sometimes it's a little been... piece you don't need. Sometimes you'll overthink it. He's like, I don't think we need the lead up. This is the joke part here. Let's yeah. take out these first three pages and just get to it. Yeah. You know, and wow. and as a stand up, you can tell like he's also working on the under more pressure because he's the one left out to dry if it doesn't yeah, work. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. So so he's feeling out kind of the geography of the bed of like, how do I get from here to here without with it, it feeling natural enough with the jokers and all that stuff. So it's yeah. So um, yeah, it's fun. So I think people in Scotland will appreciate this um, because you also show up on the show often. You often get wheeled out as like the Canadian expert. I um, yeah. yeah. Does it help to have a bit of like a second identity as Canadian, but also now being in America as a comedian? Is that, do you enjoy that? Or are you like, Ugh. No, do you know what? I love it. And I think I probably would have assumed I would be a little more tired of it than I am. Yeah. I think because it's it's such a narrow riff. And and also being in Canada, the last thing I would want to do is like Canadiana because it yeah, felt yeah. hacky to me. And there was bad versions of it where it's just, you know, moose puns and beaver puns. And you're like yeah. this isn't as a Canadian, this isn't Canada to me. But I get that that's the broad stroke joke people make. Um and then I think a couple of things happened when I moved here. One, I just missed Canada so much that yeah. you know like I have all this Hudson's Bay swag in my place that I never had when I lived <laughs> in Canada just because I want to be reminded of you know or like dumb like moose yeah. notepads that I'll get in my stock and I'm like oh I love having that stuff around now because yeah, it's totally. a nice reminder um but the nice way to use it on the show too is it's such it's such a strong riff to be like the outsider in the Canadian thing and then play off the stereotypes that of course Americans have yeah, with yeah. the Canadian thing that it's there's so much there to play with that mm. I've enjoyed it um and yeah, that's kind I of like, can, I can speak as an American I don't it, I don't think it works the other way but Americans have like a real affection for Canadians they do, yes yeah that we could surely exploit if we were if we were savvier and uh and conniving totally 100 yeah, if we weren't as close to the stereotype if the stereotype wasn't as accurate as <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> we're conniving about it. Um, yeah, exa exactly. Of it. So, can I ask about if it's you can always say pass if you don't want to talk a little bit too much about your process of sure. creating comedy. But are you someone who has like a knee jerk reaction, being like, yeah, funny, and you stick with it, or do you have like a twenty four hour stink test where you're like, actually, some things have a rate of decay. It might be funny to me now, but it's not going to be funny to me tomorrow. How do you how oh, do you work? That's interesting. Usually. Um, usually stuff doesn't erode that quickly. It, it erodes through the process. So the, the idea, the first spark of the idea, there's usually something there at least worth exploring, you know? Um, and the thing with our job is it, so with my standup, especially for all the years, I could literally just, you know, spend my days walking around and wait for the ideas to kind of fall into my head. Whereas working on a show, I remember someone was saying the show is just like our jokes are just coal for the furnace you know it it uses up material at such a high rate okay and we've kind of been doing this so now that the show's wrapping up we're doing all these retrospective montages okay. and they sent us this massive spreadsheet of every bit we've ever done and all the writers experienced this we're going through it and i've we've forgotten half of them you oh, do so wow. many jokes even those yeah. coffee table book things like i don't know how many of those i've Pitch, but you go through and you're like oh yeah I like these jokes yeah <laughs> but, and I mean Conan had that time too where the example I think he had just said is he's like you know someone we've done so many bits he goes someone asked me if I've, if I've ever been skydiving and I said no and then someone reminded me they're like no you went skydiving with like the celebrity <laughs> a bit and he's like oh did I like, <laughs> like, oh my God. Been fun. like when it's that volume there's so much but um what I would say is usually if you have the idea, we have, and we have some kind of filters built in place too. So you'll write up an idea and run it by the head writer. And you're like, hey, is this something? And there's great times where they're like, oh yeah, that's brilliant, run with it, let's do that. And then there's other times it's like, oh, I don't know. Um, maybe there's something there, we need to work on the ending. 
Or another thing that happens is the idea you bring up, say it's on, you know, a cruise ship that's been, you know, stranded because, you know, everyone has diarrhea or whatever, some dumb yeah. news story. They're like, oh, I don't think your idea, but that's a good GA or good general area. Yeah. Like there might be something. And then just by virtue of what the show is, there's things we have to hit. So if there's the presidential debates, yeah. you know, you got to have at least some monologue jokes on it and possibly a longer sketch. Like there's certain areas that it would just be weird if you didn't have it in the show. It's almost yeah. jarring. Yeah, yeah. Um, but usually the version of the stink test where it kind of wears out is if you are doing rewrites and just trying to find it or often with a free tape, you'll shoot it and you'll be editing it and it won't work the first time. And the, uh, the head writer will look, he's like, let's try doing a new cut. Maybe you shoot some new footage. And very rarely it'll happen, but sometimes it'll just be like, I think it's just not working. It'll go yeah, away. Yeah, and, and I think rehearsal needs that too. Like for most of our rehearsals for the show, we'll do three to five bits that we'll have up. And usually only one gets on the show. So you go into it knowing you need more than, you know, to, to have, yeah. have quality. Because often if it's not the quality of it, because of whatever's being used in the monologue or maybe a shorter comedy bit off the top, when you look at the three bits you have, one is a more high energy live piece and that'll serve the overall show better. So we went with that, even though it's not necessarily funnier than the free tape you put together or the commercial parody. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that'll happen is sometimes those things just get bumped and you'll get, they'll talk about kicking it up the road. You'll, you'll kick a bit up the road. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. And it's Would kind that, of nice. And, yeah. That, sorry, that actually brings me to my next question about it more is kind of the physics of writing. Do you believe that nothing's ever really wasted? So I know you have to like kill ideas sometimes that you like or let go and have to see them transformed, but even like a bit that you've come up with maybe years ago, do you see it like come up in another form if it doesn't get kind of an audience? Yeah, I think, I think a version of that that I realized really early is don't ever throw out any of your ideas. Okay. So be, and I think it was helpful as I had more years in this where say old stand-up bits, like I have the first stand-up document, I just have a Word document that's probably like 120 pages of this time with just joke ideas in it. Many that I've never done or tried because they're like, oh, is this hacky? I don't know, but it's there, but they're all there. And the amazing thing is of course, when I look back on it five years after the idea, my comedy brain is better now. So I'm like, yeah. oh, it's usually too wordy and overwritten. But I'm like, oh, but this kernel of it, I can use that idea. And, and they're great, at the very least, they're great jumping off points. Because yeah. for any writer, you, just showing up in front of a blank page with a blinking cursor, is that's not good for anyone, you know? Mm -hmm. Unless you're kind of excited and you have something in the tank to just spill out. Yeah. But if you can save as many of your old ideas, you really have to turn off that inner critic of like, this isn't good enough to even write down. Because okay. you will have that. Or you'll roll your eyes at it. It's like, get that out of the way. This is just for you. Yeah. Because then at the very least, it'll, it can kickstart. It's something to kind of get your muscles warmed up when you're getting back into writing or looking at an idea. I think that's um, really, really good advice. Um, and I do want to open the panel because I could take up all your time. And I do really want to make sure people are allowed to ask questions. So if you do have questions for Levi, the Q&A box is available to you. And I will stop talking if I see that light up. Um, Levi, in terms of coming up with new material, is there something that you really are aching to work on or something that you're really looking forward to, especially as you transition from the kind of the old form of Conan to the new one that you're going to? Yeah, I think, I mean, the big kind of broad story is just more storytelling stuff because yeah. we are such a machine gun joke. Like, you know, like the longest piece will do as far as a sketch is maybe around three minutes that's even yeah. three minutes is yeah. long or if it's a long remote that could be six or seven minutes but it's not there's not as much of a story it's it's still just boom 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 jokes and um and i think it's the thing that all of the writers are excited to kind of just work on something more narrative and, and yeah. storytelling because the, our joke muscle is so honed and the nice thing about working on a late night show is we've heard before that, that people with that experience, once they transition, say into sitcoms or something, yeah. they're so helpful in the room because yeah. by default, they're, every idea they're hearing, they're looking for any little in where a joke yeah. because that's what we do. 
And, um, and so if you can flex that muscle, then it, the thing is the flip side is I have, I have a friend who started with me on a, a, the first sketch I moved here to LA to work on a Dimitri Martin sketch show. And she's, since that has just been doing sitcom and narrative. And so, and she's doing so well because she was such a joke machine to begin with. Like yeah. that's just how she's wired. She's like, she couldn't not be a comedy writer kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so then as it was so fascinating watching her figure out narrative structure, um, yeah. not only in the course of an episode, but then in the course of a season and then in the course of five seasons and where's this gonna go? And so that is, I think, just that skill set of the way that I, that my brain works with jokes without even trying, where, whether I'm right or not, you kind of don't know ultimately in front of an audience, but at least in the early stages, I can, I can make, I know the structure, you know, I, you know, and then you can sub out the setup of the punchline and stuff, but I know how to make that click. And I don't have that as naturally with narrative stuff, just because I don't have the repetition of, of doing it. Yeah. So I think um, that feels appealing to me just to fill out another another skill set and also it just feels like another kind of sandbox to play in so i can't wait to see what comes from that sandbox of yours me, i cannot me wait too. I can't, <laughs> i'm hoping it gets emailed to me i don't know how this works i don't want to, have to sit down and do it exactly. but i'm i'm also excited to watch it once someone does it uh, well do you are you aware of what feeds your creativity and i'll cocaine. give you, I'll, cocaine yeah. look Breakfast of choice, breakfast of champions. Um, no, I, a, a former guest was saying that, you know, his friend really worked hard so that she could spend the rest, rest of her life as a writer and mm -hmm. built this kind of writing cabin in her back garden and went out there to kind of like recede from the world and then just couldn't think of any ideas and realized actually it's more she participates in the world that the kind of more it feeds her creativity. Are, are you just, are you aware of what you need to do if you feel your battery is a bit low or? Yeah, I think that's where kind of what I was touching on with uh, stepping away from stand-up, going yeah. in and out of it has been the most instructive because I don't think it's specific to stand-up, but for me, that's the thing because it, it takes down the barriers. And I think with the Conan show, with any show, there's a structure you have to work within, you know, not only for deadlines of the show, but just the format and all that stuff. And the other thing, and this is, I think most writers, I know some of the things that help me that I still don't do as much as I should. So mm -hmm. the idea of morning pages, you know, the, yeah. the kind of artist way. I think I've been hearing that probably since the artist way came out of, you know, just every morning, three pages of just, you know, stream of consciousness, don't censor yourself. Yeah. And the things that I've probably, the longest I've committed to doing that is maybe a week or two. Every time I do it, it's helpful. Yeah. And so I think, and stand up has a version of that to me. Whatever it is, it can remove all the obstacles you've put in the way mm -hmm. of doing it. And especially when I'm writing stand up. And that is when you're saying what first got you into it. It was that I liked writing so much and making myself laugh from ideas that surprised me. Because mm -hmm. when you, there's often jokes that'll just fall into your head. And you're as surprised as the audience is when you yeah, tell yeah. them. You're like, I didn't really come up with this either. <laughs> and that's the most delightful. It's channeled it, yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's, I think that's the thing that has survived the longest for me that I still have from when I was 12 about writing. It's just like, oh, I can still be caught off guard by it. The tough thing is getting yourself into just even physically the position where you're just writing because you're, you're, you're overthinking everything. Like, yeah, I'm not quite ready. I could be, be doing this like, Sure, sure, but eventually just take all the pressure off. And anything that, and I think I'm comfortable with stand-up enough that it's just so fun to me, the idea of trying out a joke in front of an audience, whether it works or not, like that you want those stakes. So that frees me up and just gets me kind of thinking in all directions. Um, so any version of that, I think, where you can just let yourself play, no pressure, it doesn't, no one has to see it, that will lead to a, and just a better sense of what you actually want to do. Because the more you write, you inevitably are going to start gravitating towards the thing that appeals to you yeah. or what your voice, you know, I guess when people talk about finding your voice, that's how you find it. Find it. And, you know, that's also a great way to, the more you do that and the more you flex that, I think your self-critic 
starts going down because you're like, oh no, I know my voice. I know these muscles. I, I, I'm more, I'm more comfortable in them. Um, Absolutely. I think that kind of cognitive therapy exercise when I first heard it was helpful where you're going to have that inner critic. And instead of trying to shut it up and saying, stop it, stop it and treating it like it's your own voice. Instead, just look at it and be like, okay, you're doing this, but I need to write right now. So I'm putting you outside of the room. I'm closing the door and I'm just going to sit in here and work. Yes. So if you can just step away from it, accept that it it's, might not go away. It's fine. You don't have to worry about it. You're over here working. Totally. I love that. That's way better advice than one of my writing teachers gave me, which is like, every time the self-critic comes up, have like a separate notebook where you write down what the self-critic saying, like let it out and then go back. And like, ultimately my self-critic was like way more interesting than what I was writing. I was like, oh, this is vicious and like creative and yeah. had a lot of energy to it. Um, I also, I tend to remember things better when I see them written. Oh. So like even someone's name on an intake, I will remember it better. I see it. So me writing down what my inner critic is saying is I'm going to be remembering their insults <laughs> totally, better yeah. than if it's I was like just thinking that I, I yeah. think that's the last thing, but yeah. whatever yeah. works, whatever works. Leva, hearing how important that kind of response is from the audience, and I'm, I will not bring up the C word, just COVID, but like, how does it feel now that there's an audience back in the studio? Oh, oh man, it's a night and day. It's yeah. even just rehearsal. So I went to rehearsal yesterday um, and Conan's running through stuff with Andy Daly, who I don't know if you know Andy Daly, is yeah. probably one of my all-time favorite comedic performers. Like, And he does a lot of stuff on our show and there's nothing, he's your dream because not only is he enthusiastic, he's like a Martin Short type where they're just made of showbiz, like entertainment yeah. comedy in the best kind of old <laughs> way. And of course, Conan has that element too. So when he's with someone like that, he's just lit up. Oh, there was such a great moment. They're doing this back and forth in this sketch yesterday, rehearsing. Oh, the thing with the audience I was gonna say is seeing them rehearsing and then just us and crew members laughing which, you know, then last oh, night, the sketch just like blew the roof off the theater because yeah. it's good. But there was a moment when, like, Andy Daly was improvising on something they were running through. And Conan just broke out of the sketch. He's like, ah, this is, I'm having so much fun. <laughs> oh, God. You could just, you could just, and we were all, everyone just laughed because we were like, yes, that, that's how we were all feeling. He's like, oh, we just, it, we didn't realize that it felt like pressure to not get yeah. to do this for so long. And it's, yeah. it was just such pure playing. I think that's what it was like in that moment. They were just, Andy was kind of saying new stuff to surprise Conan. He was doing the same yeah. thing. Oh, oh yeah, this is why we do it. This is what it's for. Yeah. Completely. Yeah. And then the writers, they're, they're doing their jokes while they're playing with it. So like, it's just like, oh yeah, this is what we've been missing. Oh, well, we've been missing you, Levi. We have to get you over to the, the Scotland. We're going to explore your roots. This is the episode two, the McDougals. We'll see where they come from. I'm all in. Um, thank you so much for joining Expo North today and being such a stellar way to close out the festival. Levi, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for watching everybody. It's just so fun. Take care. We'll, so we'll hopefully talk to you soon. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Levi. Bye. Thank you.